can't see but who are watching online with us. Welcome to worship with Augusta Heights Baptist Church. I know we've got a lot of visitors here today. I can see that. I've met some of you already. Uh, but if you are a visitor with us, especially today, we would love to know who you are if we haven't gotten a chance to meet you. And uh, you can fill out a visitor's card. Those are in the pew pockets on the back of the pews. You can drop those in these offering boxes up here, these white boxes on your way out. There's also one at the back on your way out that way. Uh, but we just want to know who you are, and we want to be available to you 
to be of service, to be of support in any way that we can. If this is where you are most weeks, good to see you. <laughs> if it's been a while since you've been here, we're glad you're back. And if you don't know why you're here today, maybe you got guilted into it by a family member, maybe you just felt like you needed to be at church today, maybe you don't even know why, we're still glad you're here. And I, for one, think you are in just the right place at just the right time. And also, we do this every week if you do want to come back. <laughs> I do also want to... Uh, Make note uh, that uh, because we have a lot of guests here, we do have restrooms. You can go out through this door uh, straight back. Uh, there's a restroom there or also down the hallway this way. Uh, feel free to use those as needed. The only thing we ask is that if you do need to excuse yourself from the service, try to do that when we're all standing up and singing hymns or something like that. Uh, preferably not during like, the sermon or prayer or solo or anything. If you can help it, we would appreciate that. I'll also let you know we have preschool worship care for our preschool age kids. Uh, it is wonderful. So after the children's sermon, if uh, you want to go out with them, uh, Miss Gail and our other volunteers can help you find your way there, get them checked in. Uh, trust me, they will probably have a better time in there than they will in here. Uh, I do want to call your attention to the announcements and opportunities, prayer concerns that are listed in your bulletin. I won't take the time to go through all of those, um, but I will just add one to our prayer concerns. Mickey Drew, one of our beloved members, uh, did have to be taken to the hospital yesterday. Um, she's doing very well. She was her usual talkative self when we got to see her. Um, she'll probably be there for a couple days and then we'll be discharged back home. Uh, but we certainly want to keep her in our prayers as she uh, makes this recovery and uh, hopefully returns home soon. You also see that we have our flowering cross. Uh, unlike a lot of churches, I mean, we had a Taylor Swift song to open worship, so we're not like a lot of churches. But unlike a lot of churches, um, we, we have ours inside because we want it to be a part of our worship. And you'll have an opportunity to participate that participate in that later in the service. Um, we have extra flowers. You may have your own that you brought as well. Uh, but we will invite you to, after the sermon to come forward. Uh, we just ask that you kind of come up this way if you can. And we'll have some folks here to help place the flowers on the cross and then walk back to your seat that way. If you're unable to make it up the steps, no worries. We will be glad to grab your flowers, and put them on the cross for you uh, because we do want everyone to have the opportunity to do the work of transforming what was this barren thing of death into a blooming symbol of life. You may also have heard or noticed that our children have alleluia bells. Yep, 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 yep. And we want those of you with bells to ring them, anytime you hear us say or sing Alleluia or Hallelujah. Yeah, just like that. Just like that. This is a great way for our kids to participate in our Easter service. And I know, I know, I know. Years ago, Ray Howell, a pastor that I knew, began giving the children of his church these Alleluia bells. There you go. You got to stay on your toes, kids. <laughs> and after the first few years of it, some people started making some comments about it to them. You know, they're too loud. They're really distracting. It doesn't feel very worshipful. But Ray would say to them, when they're grown, these kids probably won't remember the worship services they went to. They probably won't remember all the sermons they heard. They may even forget many of the Bible verses that we try to teach them. But years from now, even if they forget everything else, they will remember Alleluia and the joy of Easter. So let us celebrate the joy of Easter and the hope of resurrection. As we begin in worship, I want to invite you to join me in our call to worship. And I will point out um, those things at the end of the lines there. It's like a straight line with a dot below it. Those are exclamation marks. And so I invite you and encourage you to read with some gusto, all right? Let's join together in our call to worship. In love and for our sake, 
Christ emptied himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. But Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Light has conquered darkness. Love has conquered fear. Life has conquered death. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Jesus has been raised from the dead by the love of God. The crucified one is now alive. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. seated and we'll invite children to come forward for the children's message with Pastor Susan. Miss Susan. <laughs> Did anyone have the Easter Bunny visit them this morning? Yeah. yeah. I love, love a celebration. I love holidays because I get to celebrate. I love birthdays because I get to celebrate. I love weddings because I get to celebrate. I just love a celebration. Do y'all like it? Yeah. 
you like it because it's like maybe you get to get presents or maybe it's because my favorites are weddings because we get to dance. And so I'm going to teach you one of the best celebration dances. All right, you ready? I don't know if you know it. I do know your grown ups know it, and we're going to learn it. You ready? All right, so what I need you to do is stand up. All right. Okay, I'm going to try to help y'all learn this. If, you, if the grown-ups know it, they can help too. All right, you ready? Here you go. You know it? You gotta get down. You gotta get lower. 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 And lower. On the ground. Come on. Even lower. Okay. A little bit higher. Here we go. A little louder. A little bit louder. A little louder. Higher. Come on. You gotta jump. Here it is. I like to dance at weddings, and that's one of my favorites. It does make you tired. You a little tired? Who got the lowest? Okay. Who got the highest? Awesome. All right. So, guys, yeah, I love that song, too. What are we celebrating today? Easter. Easter. Yeah. And one of the things that we do on Easter is we celebrate the resurrection. What in the world is the resurrection? Who can raise their hand tell me what the resurrection is? I don't know what the resurrection is. Who can tell me? What do you think? We saw a wedding. It's already happened? Yes, it has already happened. What is it? Um, it's when Jesus rose from the tomb and came back to life. Yeah, it's when they buried Jesus, they put him in the tomb, and then what happened? He came back alive, and that's what we celebrate today. And guys, sometimes, guess what? Life makes us feel really, really low. It makes us feel really, really low. Like in that song, right? We got really, really, really low. And that can be really frustrating and really sad. But we have little resurrections all the time. Anytime that we're nice or kind or do something brave, we get a little bit louder and a little bit bigger. And that's the newness. That's what Greg's going to talk about today is those are little resurrections when we get a little bigger and a little bolder and a little braver to be the people that God calls us to be. So that feeling of a little bit louder now that's the resurrection feeling. And it's not one big time. It's little things that happen over and over and over and over again. So did the resurrection just happen one time? No. No. It happens any time that you are kind to someone or any time you do something that makes you more like Jesus. So let's try. You ready? Yeah. Can you get a little bit softer now? Let's see who can get the lowest. A little bit softer now? Life makes us feel like this. It does. It does. But the joy of Easter is, guess what? We can have little resurrections, and we can get a little bit louder now, and 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 a little bit louder now. Hey. 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 Hallelujah. <laughs> can you sit down and we'll say a prayer? All right. All right. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for these children who show us how much joy we can have around celebrating your resurrection and who also teach us over and over and over again that little resurrections of kindness and bravery and joy, that's the Easter story for us today. We love you. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
Celebrate today. Can we give God a hand clap of praise and thank you for everything that He has done? So, Father God, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for sending your only begotten Son. We thank you for what He has taught before He even got to the part of pain. And Father God, the pain that He endured, we thank you. We thank you that He didn't just slay everybody. But he endured the pain and suffering. He died on the cross for us, God. And we just, we just say thank you, Lord, because we know, Father God, that he is the only one that could have handled it. And as he died in the grave, Lord God, he did not just stay there. He proved the point to those that didn't believe, to those that doubted him, and he rose again. So, God, we just say thank you for the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Father God, because he rose. We don't have to stay down in our misery, that we don't have to stay down in our doubt, that we don't have to stay down and be defeated. But Lord God, we are able to rise up and Father God, serve you, love you, serve others. And God, we just say thank you this morning because you are the ultimate one. You are the one with the ultimate power. And we thank you for the resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing together once again. This time, hymn number 168, We Welcome Glad Easter. We'll do verses 1 through 3. Let's stand and sing. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look. 
there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, that is a going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mark's gospel is a lot like the 1980s sitcom Alf. Huh. No, he knew that. He know me. No? No? Okay, just go with me. Just go with me. Do any of y'all remember the show? Do you know the, the show I'm talking about? The show ALF featured a furry, wise-cracking alien life form, A-L-F, ALF, from the planet Milmac. He crashes into the lives of a suburban family who take him in, and we see him interacting with them and commenting on the absurdity of humanity, and of course, hilarity ensues. And while there are no extraterrestrials in Mark's gospel that we know of, <laughs> Both Mark and Alf end in kind of the same way. At the end of the fifth season of Alf, we see the furry alien surrounded by the government agents who are always trying to find him and catch him. And that's it. That's how it ends. Oh. It wasn't renewed for a sixth season. It was meant to be a cliffhanger to carry you over, but nothing ended up resolved. The audience was left to wonder what happened to Alf, to figure it out for themselves or to make up their own endings. In fact, I learned that the plot was only resolved several years later when someone made a made-for-TV movie about what happened in the storyline after the show's end, which is pretty much what happens with Mark's gospel, too. The original ending of the gospel was in verse 8, where Melody stopped reading with the women fleeing the empty tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Hallelujah? Yeah, y'all, come on, come on. But I mean, it doesn't really provoke an excited response there. But if you were following along on your own as Melody read the scripture, you may have noticed that in the Bible, there are more verses than that, after that. They're probably in italics, maybe they're in brackets, maybe there's a footnote about them. But most scholars believe that those verses were added later, as they appeared in some, but not all, of the ancient manuscripts of Mark's gospel. And in these additional verses, we read about Jesus appearing to Mary Magdalene and the other disciples, the ascension of Jesus into heaven, instructions about healing the sick with a touch, even drinking poison and handling venomous snakes. Mm. Yes, that's where that comes from. Mm. But all of these are really just attempts at a better ending, like the ALF made-for-TV movie, trying to tie up the loose ends and give the reader some kind of resolution. My only question is, why didn't the original author do that in the first place? Why stop where he did with the women running away, scared and bewildered, without even a cameo from Jesus? Did you notice that? He doesn't show up in Mark's Easter story. So did Mark have a bad case of writer's block? Did he reach his word limit and just couldn't quite wrap it up? Did he have a deadline and ran out of time to finish? I don't know why he ends it the way he does, but I can certainly see why someone would want to improve it. Women running away in terror and amazement, saying nothing, not saying nothing to nobody, which is actually a more accurate way to translate that phrase from Greek. Not exactly the most inspiring conclusion to the gospel story. And in fact, in Greek, the women's emotions are even more intense, tromos and ecstasis, trauma, and ecstasy. They run away 
amazed and astonished, bewildered and terrified, scared to death. The amazement, I get. It's not every day you go to visit a grave and find it empty or discover a divine messenger sitting right in front of you. I get the amazement, but the fear, the terror, the trauma? What is there to be afraid of at this point? Life has triumphed over death. Love has conquered hate and violence. Light has dispelled darkness. Suffering has been vindicated. In the light of Easter morning, we see that God's goodness is greater than the very worst we could do. As St. Anne Lamott, the author, put it, (laughs) we see on Easter that love is bigger than any grim, bleak stuff anyone can throw at us. And if you know Anne Lamott, you know she didn't say stuff, but we're in church. (laughs) Or to quote the Apostle Paul, we see on Easter that nothing in all of creation, in all of life, not even in death, can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Now that gets a hallelujah. Hallelujah. And yet, lots of us are still Scared to death, of death, and sometimes of life. We hear and see enough to know that our world and life as we know it is scary. School shootings, terrorist attacks, terminal diagnoses and incurable diseases, poverty and homelessness, strained and shattered relationships, loss and grief. Life can be scary. But maybe just as scary as this life and this world as we know it are the unknowns of a new life and a new world that comes alive on Easter. When the lines between life and death and victory and defeat and power and weakness and heaven and earth start to get blurred. When we are asked to believe that there's more to reality than only what we can grasp. And maybe things like reconciliation and justice and forgiveness and peace really are possible. And that is the good news of Easter. That our world and our lives have been irrevocably changed. That nothing will ever be the same again. And that is the terrifying part of Easter. That our world and our lives have been irrevocably changed. And nothing will ever be the same again. I think that's why the women fled. They had come to anoint a corpse because that's what you do with a body. And if the body had been there, they could have gone through the prescribed motions just as they planned for, just as they had expected. But what do you do when the tomb is empty when you get there? What do you do when a man who was nailed to a cross is resurrected and nothing you thought was solid and sure seems nailed down anymore? Well, one thing you can't do is just go about business as usual. How ridiculous would it have been for the women to get there and say, he's not here, so let's just pour some oil on this spot where he was. Like pouring one out for Jesus, I guess? (laughs) No, the transforming power of Easter, the reality of new life, is not found in a graveyard. It's not found in a tomb, even if it is empty. As that divine messenger told those women, the risen Christ goes ahead of us, calling us forward into the future, even toward what is yet unknown, into new life. And the promise is, that's where we will see him. As Pastor Chuck Poole put it, the risen Lord is always out in front of us, leading us further than we meant to go, dreamed to go, or wanted to go, calling us down strange streets in unfamiliar neighborhoods, introducing us to people we did not plan to know, involving us in needs we did not plan to meet. Hmm. So the question for us on Easter is will we be guardians of an empty tomb or followers of the risen Christ? I have to warn you, though, this is not a quick and easy answer. Like those stuttered endings to Mark's gospel, the business of following the risen Christ into the new life he brings is not a one-time, 
over and done with, once resurrected, always resurrected kind of thing. It's a process. As again and again, God brings us back to life so that we can get back into the business of following Jesus more faithfully. It's what Thomas Merton spoke of as a series of resurrections, large and small, that lead to our transformation in Christ. Over and over again, God brings us back to life, new and abundant, calling us and shaping us into more and more of the likeness of Jesus. It's just that it's not always pretty. I learned that from Jake the Snake Roberts. <laughs> I see the same people who laughed about Al for laughing uh, about Jake the Snake Roberts. Jake the Snake is a Hall of Fame professional wrestler, wrestler, I should say, as in WWF. He was especially popular in the late 80s and early 90s, a time period also known as my childhood fandom of professional wrestling. So I was excited when a few years ago I found out there was a documentary about him on Netflix. And one night, Susie and I were sitting there, and I asked her what she wanted to watch on TV, and she said, oh, I don't really care. <laughs> and I still don't think she has forgiven me for turning on the resurrection of Jake the Snake. <laughs> it was interesting to watch, but it was hard to watch, too. Partly because it wasn't all that good, ends up but also because unbeknownst to fans like nine-year-old me, Jake wrestled with his own demons. And both during and after his career in the ring, alcoholism and addiction and alienation from his family. Mm. Of course, the resurrection of the documentary's title comes through friends that help Jake get sober and healthy and reconnect with his kids. But it's hard to watch because in one scene you see Jake doing yoga and talking with his support group and saying things like, I'm finally on the right path. I realize how much I have to live for and I don't want to throw that away. And then literally the very next scene, just a couple days after that, you see one of his friends get a call and the voice on the other end of the line says, uh, we need some help. You got to go get Jake. He's drunk and shoeless at the airport. It happens multiple times over the course of the film. Mm -hmm. And of course, the documentary ends on a high note, with Jake being induced, uh, inducted into the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, reconciled with his family and clean and sober. And as far as I and a quick Google search know, he still is. Mm -hmm. But it just goes to show that resurrection isn't a quick, clean, one-time event. Even Jake, at one point in the film, says, this is going to be a rest-of-my-life process. Mm -hmm. Resurrection is a process. This new life is always unfolding as each new day, each new hour, each new moment dawns before us. As God brings us to life, drawing us more and more toward the life that God intends for us and for all of God's children. I've gotten to witness and experience some of this firsthand just in the past few weeks. I shared some of this in the Maundy Thursday service the other night, but not nearly as many of you were there, so I'm definitely going to tell it again. You may have noticed that the cross we have up here is not the same one we've used for a flowering cross in the past. And if you parked over by the gym and walked through coming to the building, you may have noticed that the small mechanical building there, the doors and the windows are boarded up. These things are not unrelated. About a month ago, we discovered a couple of people who had gotten into the mechanical building and had been living there for a week, maybe two. We tried to direct them to resources in our community for people who are experiencing homelessness or struggling with addiction, but we did have to ask them to leave. It just wasn't safe for us or for them, really. And so they did leave, and they left the building a mess. Wet, dirty clothes, old, moldy food, drug paraphernalia. It was gross. I can still smell the smell as I walked in. 
absolutely dismissive. <clears throat> and I was absolutely furious. This was our property that they broke into and trashed, and now we're stuck having to clean it up, having to secure the buildings, or having to pay somebody to do these things which aren't cheap. And these are people that we are trying to help, that we want to help, that we feel called to help, to work and advocate for, to get treatment, to have housing, to be treated with dignity and respect, and yet this is how they treat us and our space. Nevertheless, we hoped they would move along, find a safer place to stay, get connected with organizations that could help them get housed, get clean, get a better life. So we secured the building, boarding up the windows, putting new locks on the doors, which they broke off and broke in again. And so we boarded it up and we locked it up again. We made plans to get it all cleaned out. But then last week, we started talking about getting ready for Easter and getting out the flowering cross. And Eric asked oh so innocently one day in staff meeting, well, where do we keep it? <laughs> Keep it in there, amidst half-eaten scraps of food and used needles and filthy clothes and makeshift bedding, amidst all of the evidence of a tragic, lamentable, miserable experience. The cross was in that dark place of deep human suffering, among people who many in our society wouldn't even think are worthy of God's love, much less our compassion or our help. People that might not even think that about themselves. Our Easter cross was in a place of deep pain, among people in pain. People who need resurrection as much as any of us. Now obviously we couldn't reuse the cross for safety and sanitary reasons, but it did make a powerful image and illustration for my Maundy Thursday sermon. And that's where I thought it ended. They were gone. The building was finally boarded up. We had it secured. Good story. And yesterday I happened to swing by the church and discovered that somebody had tried to get back in there and ripped off the boards and tried to smash a lock and broken out the window and I was angry all over again more angry and frustrated than I had been before and I felt powerless and I felt like this work that we're doing as people of faith, well, what's the point? And I confess it was all too easy to jump to the idea that these people were somehow less than me. Less deserving of help and compassion, less deserving of their human dignity. Why do they keep doing this? Why are we even trying to help them to be kind? When will they finally get out of that dark place of pain and hurt and suffering and step out into the light and into healing and into some kind of new life? Well, I could ask myself the same question. Because truth be told, I need a resurrection just as much as they do. From my self-righteousness and sense of superiority, from my anger that allowed me to diminish their dignity and to see them as anything less than a beloved child of God. From the quick abandonment of my faithfulness as soon as it was challenged. From all of the ways that I am not living in the fullness of the new life to which Christ calls us. I preached that message on Thursday night. And there I was again on Saturday morning needing to hear it again. Needing another resurrection. And this morning too. Because resurrection didn't just happen once in some ancient tomb in Palestine. And it doesn't happen only once for any of us either. It happens any time God reaches down into the tombs in which we are trapped and into the graves we dig for ourselves, whether it's addiction or anger, homelessness or hubris, breaking and entering or believing our exceptionality as beloved more than someone else. Any time God finds us and brings us back to life, back into the fullness of life that God intends for us and for all back 
into the way of Jesus. It's not a singular, simple salvation, but an entirely new way of being and behaving and living. I actually think that's why the women flee the empty tomb in fear. That's why the last word of this story is afraid. Because they know that nothing will ever be the same again. Not if we let this new life come alive in us. Maybe Mark ends with fear, leaving it open-ended because he hopes we will finish it. That we might be scared to life. That we would find the courage to allow this new life to come alive in us, propelling us to go forth and look for the presence of the risen Christ, to be the presence of Christ in our world, finding and following our risen Lord wherever he may be. So no, Mark isn't very good with endings. Then again, it's not really the end. Though I suppose that depends on us. And hallelujah. <laughs> As we have in the past, this year once again we have a flowering cross that we will embellish as an embodied act of worship. Because there is a physicality to our spirituality. To participate in this, we have to stand up in the pew. We walk to the front, you know, on this side and then going across and then going down that side. We put the flowers on the cross. We have to use our bodies and embody the hope of new life, even if just in this small act, even if some of the lilies haven't opened up yet because, well, resurrection is a process. As we allow this new life to come to life in your life, but even in this small way, perhaps we can see that however seemingly insignificant our acts and experiences of resurrection may be, they add little by little, one by one, to the unfolding life that is before us, to the process by which love is conquering evil and injustice and fear and hate and life that is blooming even from death, and the hope that God might yet do it again maybe even in us. So I invite you to come and let us transform this cross. Let us be transformed. <laughs> Thank you.
So if you have felt the presence of God lifting you out of whatever grave you may find yourself in, we encourage you and invite you to respond. As we stand together and sing our closing hymn, number 173, Christ is Alive, we'll do verses 1, 2, and 5. Let's stand and sing together. be seated for just one moment and allow me amidst the hugs um, to introduce Michael and Tanya Keaton. Uh, Y'all come on over. They are making it official. They actually made this decision months ago, but they said, we love Easter. And that is the day that we want to say we are embarking on this new, new life. This new stage of life together here as a part of this resurrection community of faith. So if you will welcome them and receive them into this fellowship and walk alongside them as we journey together in the way of Christ, will you please affirm that by saying, Amen. 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 We are so glad that y'all are here. Um, after every, y'all can sit back down. That's, that's totally fine. Um, after everything is said and done, I hope y'all will make your way back up here, allow folks to speak with you and, and say hey to you. We'll of course get a picture to post all over social media. Um, but we are just thrilled that you are here and again stepping in to this new life with us and our life with you. Thank you again for being here today as we close out our Easter service. I invite you to. Hear the poetic reflection and then stand and hear the good news sung to us once again with lots and lots of hallelujahs. Hear now our poetic reflection. Forget about the afterlife. Resurrection is not for dead people. It's for those of us most alive. It's the way we live when we've gotten over being afraid of dying because maybe... We took to heart the raising of Jesus, and maybe because our life got ripped out of our hands. Either way, God stayed with us and gave us life, raised us up out of the coffin of our individualism and its brittle, consuming survival, and made us part of the risen body of Christ, alive with a life that's irrevocable and such a gift that we've gotten over death as a thing, and now we live not in the afterlife but in this life. The afterlife of what we're not lo- no longer afraid of, totally free to love no matter what. Resurrection is the unkillableness of love that nothing can stop, not even death and despair. Resurrection is when we love to the bitter end, even when it's really bitter and really the end. And God carries it on anyway in a grace that we can't see because the love we have is actually God, and God is eternal. Resurrection is what gives us the audacity to get up all in the devil's face with joy and kindness and hope and laugh at all his threats and love people as if there were tomorrow or no tomorrow precisely because there always is one, and it's always 
God. Christ has brought and allow the life of Christ to come alive in us. And as we go, we pray that God would give us grace. Grace never to sell ourselves short. Grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to remember that the world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. So may God take our minds and think through them. May God take our lips and speak through them. May God take our hands and work through them. And may God take our hearts and set them on fire with the joy of Easter, this day, every day, and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Go enjoy. Happy Easter. Hallelujah.